Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the A to Z Running podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I am Zach, and this week's episode is dedicated to all of you crazy marathoners out there who are running things like the majors and all the other stuff, among many other racing experiences you're having, because we are talking about post-race recovery, and specifically the top three things you need to be doing and doing in certain ways to optimize that recovery. Why? Because you want to feel good as soon as possible after the bad that that race experience made you feel. So that is exactly what we're going to cover in the episode. And after that, stick around because we're going to talk about the world of running and share what went on in the Chicago and Boston marathons, among other things. So to get all of this great content, you're going to find us on all the podcast apps, Apple, Google, all of those places. You're going to find us on YouTube so you can watch if you're just that crazy. And of course, we're on places like Instagram so you can you know get all the content via those avenues as well. But the best and most important place to find us is a to z running.com. Look for the word follow. Not hard to find because it's right next to the word coaching. Hmm. Thanks for the tip, Zach. So one of the places Zach mentioned was Instagram, where I pose this question that I'm going to ask Zach first. What is the first thing you want after finishing a marathon? Hmm. Do you have an answer for me? Generally, nothing. Um, I want nothing. I just want to be done. But since you're already done, then I guess the best answer to the question is in 2015 at the Chicago Marathon, I finished the race. I walked the 110 miles that it takes to get back to the start area. (laughs) And then found this tent where there were people doing massages, right? Except there weren't any people in the tent getting massaged at that moment. And there were like 50 massage tables. And I walked in that tent and something like 27 different masseuses all gathered around me, set me on a table and proceeded to simultaneously massage every part of my body at once. And I'm not kidding you. What? I am fairly certain that Zeus himself sent those people there. Oh my goodness. But it was really something. So that's exactly what I want now after every single race. Yeah. And now all of us are going to be jealous that we're not going to get that kind of experience. That doesn't happen. That doesn't even happen with the the professionals. They don't have 27 people surround them. They have like one masseuse. That's insane, Zach. Anyway, now we can add that to our list of dreams. But the first thing that many of you wanted after a marathon were these things. Chocolate milk. Pizza was a high contender, ice cream, burgers, naps, showers, and then many of you did say massages. Speaking of massages, since we all can't have 27 masseuse like Zach, we have Roof Tree Health Elite Massage Gun on the go. Great tool to have. It's a percussion massage gun. And today I wanted to show you a couple of the applications. And the one that I have on right now is the cushion. And this is the one that if you guys ran some of these marathons, and I know some of you guys actually purchased these um, after talking with us, but this is for tender spots and sensitive areas. And it's a, it's a wider head, so you should be able to use it on those really sore muscles, the ones that, you know, when you're going up and down the stairs, you're feeling quite pronounced. And then we have, for when you're feeling a little bit better, this bullet, which gets to hard reached it's hard to reach massage uh, target groups. And so, um, yeah, this is very pointed. You want to be careful with this one. I would definitely start on one of the lower power settings with this one. It's, it's, this is serious business guys. And then we have like the flat head for denser muscle groups. And then this is the one we have on, uh, quite often Zach and I, this is for large muscle groups. And finally the fork, which gets the Achilles and some of the other muscles that uh, you might have that, um, how do I explain it? It gets two spots at once for those of you who are listening and not watching, but it helps along the Achilles tendon. And so that- curious which exactly you should be using post-race 
Stick around for our conversation during the main topic when we touch on there are certain things you should not do to your muscles post-race and certain things that would be beneficial. And it'll touch specifically on which kind of attachment to put on your massage gun. Very good. Well, thank you, Zach. Let's get on to the main topic. So for our main topic here, what I'm going to try to cover here is what we should do to maximize or optimize recovery post-race. Think about three scenarios for a moment. You finish a big race, and scenario one, feeling tired, spent, maybe a little bit sore. Not tired enough to sleep on a rock, but definitely beat. Scenario two, feeling exuberant, ecstatic. It was a big effort, but really hit a home run, and body is feeling great. Scenario number three, feeling like the bus that ran over me got its tips from the 18-wheeler before it and all the things that come with it. So what do these three scenarios have in common? You still need to optimize recovery after any one of them. So the key idea, no matter what the degree of effort given or the trauma experienced, the body needs to recover, ideally sooner rather than later. So to do so, we need three things, or at least these are the three most important things categorically, and we're going to cover them in some detail here. The first is rest, the second blood flow, and the final is nutrition. So our ability to recover fully and quickly then depends on our ability to optimize those three things. Side note for a moment, perhaps um, an even greater influence on recovery is your actual, our actual preparation prior to the event itself. So proper training yields not only better results, but certainly uh, better recovery as well. And that should never be underestimated. Um, if you hate the way you feel after a marathon or, you know, just don't like that whole just being run down hardcore after a big effort, uh, might be that some key changes in your training could be the thing that you need. So the question here is, uh, why do these three things matter and how can we best optimize them. So first is rest, not just about taking days off here. Uh, most of us forget that the rest is about more than just being off our tired legs um, or sore muscles for a bit. There's, there's a lot more to the concept than that. Think about three, essentially three uh, aspects of what we need to rest. Musculoskeletal system is certainly the one we tend to feel the most. Uh, that's the trauma to tissues and bones um, and, and the stuff that we feel sore and we feel like something's hurting, all that kind of thing. Micro tears, possible stress responses in the bones themselves, all of that. So what do we do? Of course we sleep. Um, that's when the body repairs itself best. We know that. That's when uh, our body's production of the good enzymes that we need um, is happening or happening at a very high level. Um, and then also to, to rest this system, we need to avoid things like impact forces, anything that can cause further trauma to something that's uh, hurt or that's sore or otherwise. Um, and then activity matters here, uh, changing positions often. So like if I sit in the same position for a long period of time, that doesn't necessarily help. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about more about that here in a moment with one of the other categories, but um, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, you know, moving between those things. Um, a good example of things to avoid is like going and sitting in a car for five hours right after a hard effort, things like that. Um, the second big category here uh, is the energy systems, and we need to rest our energy system. Um, things like depleted fuel stores, uh, of course, that involves replenishing. We'll talk about that. Um, and then cellular recovery. We could talk about like your mitochondria, for example, the ener energy powerhouse in your cell. Um, the mitochondria do a whole lot of work in something like a marathon or um, certainly longer distance races, even more than anything else. And take a fair bit of time to recover from that work. Um, it could be even in, in some cases, depending on the nature of the load, it could be something like up to weeks. So we need the rest for that. Uh, so what do we do in the sense of energy systems? We stay low key, um, we get the sleep, and and of course the refueling uh, matters there. Um, we, we don't want to be expending a ton of energy when we're in a rest state. So that doesn't just mean going out for a run, that means the other things, the, the other activities. Um, and then what about this third category, nervous system fatigue? This is an interesting one for me uh, because it, it seems to explain or help explain some of the ways that I feel that don't seem to be directly attached to uh, the, like my muscles and bones and things like that. 
Um, and so that is especially prevalent in long, hard efforts or short, super intense efforts. Um, like sprinters tend to feel nervous system fatigue just as much as in some ways, not always, but certainly in some ways as much as um, like a longer distance race. So then uh, within that, we also have the mental and emotional aspect of this. And that's where I tend to notice post-marathon specifically, where I feel that kind of very low mental and emotional state, um, which is tied directly to the burden I placed on my nervous system to try to run at such a high level of activity for such a long time uh, tends to influence that in different ways for everyone. It's not the same for everyone, but it certainly does influence that. So then what, uh, what do we do about nervous system fatigue? Well, sleep helps. <laughs> also, uh, avoiding high stimulation activities. And so things that cause us stress, positive or negative, uh, but things that cause us stress should be avoided when we're trying to recover from a hard effort like this from a race. Um, we wanna be relaxing. And so like reading a book that is relaxing to me, you know, something that's not, again, that's not high stimulation. Um, stare out a window, go sit on a porch somewhere, or if it's really cold outside, maybe sit next to a window and just stare outside. Um, and that's, it, that's an interesting remedy. And you can now tell your family members that uh, I just recommended that you sit and stare out a window for recovery from your effort. But in fact, Having a little bit less demand on my mental faculties does matter, especially in the days following. So a quick summary here for rest. Um, at its core, the need for rest is, it, it, in any of the above areas, is best addressed by plenty of sleep, foremost, always. Um, but certainly there's some other little nuances that make a difference. And that's, you know, like uh, one of our runners, Bill, for example, um, Good idea to take the next day off of work after a big race or a big effort. You, if, if you have to be at work the next day and you have the opportunity to take it off instead, it's likely to help you bounce back more easily. Um, don't try to travel right away because, you know, with all of these things considered that I just mentioned, travel tends to be bad in all of those areas. You're getting less sleep, you're resting less, or you're sitting in one position for too long without moving, um, or the, just the general stress and anxieties that surrounds travels. So something to consider. Now, number two in our big three of things to think about for recovery, blood flow. So bringing the good stuff where it needs to be is the key. If fatigue and and all of that kind of stuff, like soreness and all of that, if, if that is poverty, here's my analogy for you. If that's poverty, nutrition is gold, but blood is the genie in the lamp granting all your body parts all their wishes. How's that for an analogy? For blood flow. Excellent. Well, anyway, um, something like that. The point is that uninhibited blood flow is the imperative to recovery because your blood's bringing all the stuff that you need to the places where it needs to be. So resting is great, but if your blood's not flowing properly while you're resting, then it's delaying the recovery factors that we need. So blood carries oxygen, blood carries nutrition and nu nutrients. Um, blood also removes or carries out the bad stuff brings it through your, your processing centers that will get rid of it for you. So blood is doing all of the things that we need in terms of moving stuff where it needs to be. So then what inhibits or reduces blood flow matters here uh, because that's the, this is the kind of stuff we need to try to avoid. Uh, dehydration, blood is mostly water, so it needs lots of it to move well. Um, inflammation, and so there's, there's kind of a tension here because inflammation is a necessary evil in some senses, uh, but it also is, in a general sense, an evil because that's the, the, your blood is pooling. It's it's uh, directed toward a certain spot and less so to other spots. That's what the inflammation is. If you think about it, it's not like you suddenly have more blood with the inflammation. That's not what's happening. Just blood that would be other places is kind of funneling into a single spot a little bit more. Um, so an inflammatory response tends to be a reduction in blood flow in system-wide. Um, or at least in some areas. And so there's a concern potentially there. And then of course, constricted fibers. And like if, you're, if your muscle fibers are bound up with each other uh, and, and the fascia, that can influence blood flow uh, to some areas as well. So what do we do about it then for our blood? Um, drink lots of water, loads and loads of water. Be sure electrolytes are present because if you drink too much water without electrolytes, like just throughout the day, um, 
especially if you're doing things like sweating or something. Uh, but if you're drinking lots and lots of water without electrolytes, then, then you may actually be dehydrating some of your systems as well. So lots of water, but make sure you got electrolytes. Take some anti-inflammatories if, and so we don't give medical advice here, but um, talk to a doctor if you'd like to do that to get the medical advice. But anti-inflammatories can help in a general um, reduction in inflammatory response so the blood's moving more easily. Maybe a day or two of that, um, several doses, and then that should be enough. Um, known to help speed recovery in that immediate reaction to things. So uh, additionally, uh, drink water, if I didn't mention that already. Um, gentle tissue massage and myofascial release types of things that are non-traumatic, um, those are very helpful because remember, those fibers need to be moving in fluid and when they start to get bound up with each other, it constricts. And so anything that's tight and tense that is kind of bound up, it helps to do a little bit of massaging types of things. Um, not necessarily like the sit and stretch, static stretch kind of stuff can be actually dangerous at this state because you have fibers that are in a reduced integrity state. And so you don't necessarily want to sit down and stretch those really hard because um, that can cause more micro tears, or at least it delays the healing of some of the micro tears potentially. So things like gentle massage, myofascial types of work, as long as it's low trauma stuff. Um, and then keep drinking water throughout all of this. That's good. Activation and activity that avoids impact, if possible, is necessary because if I just sit here, my blood is not flowing thoroughly well all the way through all of my extremities. And so if I need my blood in the right places at the right time consistently, I need to have some degree of activity involved in that. Um, walking, biking, you know, things that are no impact. Um, even just like if you lay on your back and you bicycle your legs up in the air, um, that can help. And, and doing it like kind of like frequently throughout the day so that the blood is just continuing to be encouraged to circulate and flow. And finally, drink water. <laughs> Lots of fun little devices, by the way, out there designed to help with stimulating blood flow. Um, some of them are more gimmicky than others, but the reality is some of these things can indeed help. If, you're, if you have to sit on a plane, for instance, um, the electrical stimulation types of stuff is known to potentially increase, at least increases activity, muscle fiber activity, which can help with this. Um, I don't know that I would, I would staple anything on to ensuring that it encourages recovery, but it, it's intended to be able to help with activation, which should help with recovery. Um, massage guns, and so you hear us talk about Roof Tree a bit right now. Uh, their products, among others, um, are the kinds of things that just help uh, kind of stimulate without, again, low trauma. So don't do like trigger point types of stuff with those massage guns. Do use the like the softer, flatter heads. Um, and then even things like the vibrating rollers and orbs and things that are out there. Um, again, the myofascial dynamic is helpful if it's gentle, but those vibrating ones help to just encourage more activity without having to like dig further in, which is not a bad thing at all. Quick summary about blood flow. You're not going to like me saying this, but uh, remember that some things are exactly counter to the logic presented here. Things like uh, substances that increase levels of toxins in our bloodstream or in our body, those should be avoided immediately after. I know everyone, everyone's sitting here thinking, but wait, don't they? Or, but how, but this is the time when I'm celebrating it. Yeah. Okay. Listen, we're talking about recovery and, and optimizing recovery. Those things slow recovery. Now do with that what you will. But, um, other things that, and uh, some of this will hit close to home for some of you, and some of it will hit close to home for others of you. Diuretics and the various different kinds of diuretics out there. As you well know, things that involve high amounts of caffeine, like coffee and such. Um, so those can also reduce recovery time because a diuretic tends to move things through your system faster than it should to fully absorb what it needs. Um, and so that includes liquids like water. Um, it also includes nutrients, which we'll talk, talk about in a moment. Um, maybe give ourselves two more days. Of, so here's, here's the thing. Uh, we, we view race day as like the, this is when I, I've worked all of this work for this and now I can celebrate and now I can let loose. Now I can, you know, the discipline can kind of ebb a little bit for a time. Um, maybe, maybe it's better to think about it as two days after race day is when the discipline ends. So I need to be disciplined in my rest and recovery for a couple of days it really, I mean, longer is probably better, but give me two days here and I can assure you that it will help. So some thoughts to consider there. Um, and then and then that ties directly to nutrition. And this is our third and our final category. We got to eat well, we got to eat lots, or at least um, 
eat often. And I'll talk about the lots here in a moment too. So we can't, we can't overestimate the importance of replenishing everything, everything as quickly as possible. Um, our body, especially in long race efforts or very intense, uh, longer, hard efforts, things like that, um, our body is using not just, you know, a few fuel sources. It's using a lot of different kinds of things and it needs all of them. And generally sooner is better than later. So start with the macro nutrients for a moment. Um, that's the protein, carb, fat uh, categories. First priority is getting the fuel storage back up a bit. And so it, we know, especially proteins and carbs, and yeah, there's a lot about like the ratios and stuff. Um, that really, I mean, sure, that kind of matters in terms of like helping just uh, a, a little nudge in the right direction. But in general, just get a lot of it and, and you're doing a good work. Um, I think the reason why that ratio even exists is that because people tend to not get enough protein. And so really make sure you're getting enough carbs and protein. And then we need the fats too. So really we just need all of it. <laughs> we, need, we need all of it so that we can recover well. Um, remember that uh, how the body absorbs things matters here too. Um, and so that's the, the point of like eating, eating lots, but eating often. So our body tends to absorb only so much of something in a given period of time. Like if I, if I take in tons and tons of sugar right now, it won't all get absorbed. Um, and so some of it will just, just go right through me. Um, that being the case, if I eat a little bit less and eat again soon after I'm absorbing on in total, a little bit more of the nutrition involved in what I ate than if I just ate a huge meal and then you know, four or five hours before my next consumption. So something to consider. We'll touch on that again in a moment. Now, the micronutrients is a piece that we tend to miss severely. And that's in large part because it's just hard to get all of the micronutrients that our body is needing for all of its necessary functions um, in, in naturally. We'll, and we'll come back to that. So think about it like this. If your muscles run out of calcium, where do they go to get the calcium? Your bones. And so your bones might be in a weakened state uh, potentially in some areas. Um, that's why things like stress fractures and stress reactions as a result of some of this stuff can happen so easily. Uh, magnesium helps muscles relax, also aids in digestion of macronutrients like protein, carbs, and fat, all of them. Um, iron is a key ingredient in hemoglobin, which is then helping transport oxygen in your blood. And zinc is involved in energy metabolism as well as helping synthesize the hemoglobin. So contributing to that oxygen transportation. And then if you think about all of those things, vitamin D helps the body absorb calcium and zinc and magnesium better among other benefits by itself. And vitamin C helps absorb iron better. So if I need some of those things, I need some of these other things to help absorb those things well, otherwise I have to take in even more of it. Um, you can see the connections there. All of these things are utilized and depleted in some fashion in the work that we're doing during races. Think about, again, something like potassium. Um, your body is depleting large amounts of potassium if you're running things like a marathon. So we got to replenish that stuff because that's the stuff that makes our body work properly. Um, boosting micronutrient intake after races is uh, a key method of ensuring that the body has those things. Um, and, and I say that boosting it specifically because in general, in a normal diet, we are almost definitely not getting enough of these micronutrients um, specifically for what we need in a recovery state. Um, and, and probably even day to day it is also true. So supplementing in some capacity, boosting our intake with some kind of supplementation is probably necessary to, to fully realize the potential benefits or to fully regain what we need or what we lost. Another quick note then about absorption, I was mentioning that earlier. Um, so if the body only has so many ways to absorb different things, that's also true that the body only has so many receptors for certain kinds of things. Um, and so I can only absorb so much sugar, but I also, I have receptors for a lot of different kinds of things. So a, a varied meal with a lot of different sources of things is the best way to go here because I'm getting more of that stuff. And then I do that frequently as opposed to a large amount all at once, spread it out over time, eating a massive meal in 30 minutes, not so good as eating a couple of smaller meals in two hours, you know, something like that. So that's how I'm going to best maximize the nutrition side of all of this. So quick summary, eat well and supplement. Uh, eat lots, meaning like variety and eat often to maximize absorption. There you go. Now, what this brings us to, these are our big three. So when we talk about recovery, we are talking about how, when I'm done with a hard effort race, especially uh, something where I'm really going all the way to the well, um, what are the things that I need in order to end up in the best place possible? And that's, that's the rest, blood flow, and nutrition that are necessary. 
Now, a final comment on this, uh, the entire motivation for the principle of recovery is either that you have another thing that you're trying to get to, so like another race or my next season, I want to get started on that sooner rather than later, or um, you just want to feel good. I, I, I just don't, I don't love feeling awful after races. Um, and, and if you're like me, I feel awful physically and mentally and emotionally. Um, and I don't love that. So the question here is, what can I do to get beyond that as quickly as possible? Because chances are you probably do want to feel good. And so do the good work now, reap the rewards now and later. Now let's get on to the world of running. This week in the world of running, we have many congratulations to give to many of you who race this past week or weekend. And our A to Z runners that also race, we have a couple half marathoners, Christy and Emily, and Kathy ran a 5K. We have Chicago marathoners, Bill and Julie. And at the Boston Marathon, we had Kathy, Terry, Aaron, Dan, and a PR for Zach Start. So let's hop right in to the Windy City, Chicago news. Chicago Marathon happened on Saturday, and I wanted to give a fun fact to start it off. It takes 16 days to set up the Chicago Marathon and five days to tear everything down. Now, I have a personal fascination with this because I work in events. In fact, right now I'm working at the State Fair of Texas. So I go to a lot of places where I see some elaborate setups. And to imagine that the Chicago Marathon has all of these details going into place brings my appreciation level up a little bit more, especially with this fact. It takes two days to remove the goose poop from the grass at the park. So thank you to all of you who work so hard to put on these events. It really is phenomenal. So let's set the, set the stage of the race itself. Now, NBC Chicago reported that conditions had not been this warm since 2007. Race temps were in the 70s and humid. So a lot of people were going for finishes, for placement, for doing the best that they very could on that day, despite these difficult conditions. Sefutura was the first Ethiopian men's winner since 2012, and he won in a time of 2.06.12. This is his first major marathon win, but he's won Milan and Shanghai Marathon, so he's no stranger to top-level finishes. And then USA's Galen Rupp ran the closest to his PR of anyone on the podium. He ran a 2.06.35, and Rupp's PR is 20607, which he ran in Prague in 2018. So that's a great showing for Galen Rupp. And there were three men in the final quarter of the race before uh, before Sifu uh, like started running off at 7K. And that third place finisher was Eric Kiptenui. And he ran a time of 20651. Now on the women's side, it was very interesting. I love watching tactics play out. 2019 world champion Ruth Chepnagedich won in a time of 2.22.31, but what was fascinating about Ruth's race is that she went out in under world record marathon pace. Now we would expect that someone like Ruth might take her swing at the record, but it was not any day for that kind of race, but Zach and I were speaking of different race strategies that could happen before the Chicago event took place, and we were thinking that it was possible that some of these runners might run a really aggressive first half when the uh, temps are a little bit cooler, and then when the and when it heats up, they will have like banked a little time. And that's not the usual way to run a marathon race, but if you're thinking about it in terms of the effort given, if it's going to be cooler in the front side, then they take a risk and maybe run uh, bank a little bit time on the front end. Um, that's not like I said, that's not typically the way you want to run this kind of race, um, but. It did, it did work for Ruth, and she was, um, yeah, she just took it off, and she, like, had it the entire time. She did fade, so she ended up running a much slower time than world record pace, and uh, her PR, I should mention, is the fourth, fourth fastest in the world's history of 2.17.08. That's her PR, and the time she ran in Chicago was 2.22.31. 
the real inspiring story for us, especially since she's been a previous guest on this podcast, was Emma Bates taking the runner up spot, the second place finish. And in a post that I kind of dug up from August, Emma Bates reflected on how she placed fourth overall in the Chicago Marathon in the past and that she was looking to crack the top three, which she did. And it was cool to see her strategy play out, which was the opposite of Ruth's. She took it out more conservatively. She did not try to run with that chase pack, but rather made her way up to them. She kind of ran her own race and then ended up overtaking the chase group. And due to the weather, third place finisher Sarah Hall adjusted her goals for the marathon. I had mentioned last week that she was looking at that American record from Dina Castor, and she knew that that wasn't really going to be possible because of the conditions. So she adjusted to finishing as well as she possibly could. And she ran, you know, a third place finish at a major marathon, which is excellent. In a post-race interview with NBC, she said she thought she was going out conservatively, but in hindsight, maybe she should have gone out slower. It was just pretty brutal out there. And then fourth place is one of my favorites to follow, and that's Kira D'Amato. She claimed fourth place. And if you'll remember, she had to drop off, well, she had to withdraw from the Olympic trials, the U.S. Olympic trials before the Tokyo Games because she had some injuries. So we didn't get to see her uh, complete that cycle, which was really strong. She'd been running really strong 10Ks, and she was a favorite to potentially win a spot on Team USA. So this was a wonderful comeback for Kira D'Amato, placing fourth at the Chicago Marathon. Now, quickly on to the Boston Marathon that happened Monday, October 11th. Fun fact about Boston, it's the only major marathon to be held on a weekday, and this was the 125th Boston Marathon, and it was 910 days in the waiting because of COVID, so highly anticipated, a smaller field than ever before. Now, on the men's side, the winner was from Kenya, Benson Kipruto of I already said of Kenya, in a time of 2.09.51. And even though it was Kipruto's first major marathon win, similarly to our Chicago winner, uh, Sifu Tura, he has won other marathons, just not a major. So he won the 2021 Prague Marathon and the 2018 Toronto Marathon as well. And there were two American men claiming finishes in the top 10. Colin Benny was seventh in a time of 2.11.26. Now, he's run under 2.10. Uh, he ran that at the Marathon Project, so he's one to be paying attention to, to, paying attention to. And then CJ Albertson, he ran the most gutsy race that we have seen in a while. He took it out hard. He was ahead of the whole field by quite a bit, and he eventually was caught uh, 20 minutes shy of the two-hour mark, and he finished 10th. And that was a little bit of a surprise that is just a show of his strength and determination because the chase group was coming on really hard and it was a really big group. So the fact that he still held on and got that 10th place finish was super inspiring. Now, I was super curious. I don't know if any of you guys were curious, but hopefully this satisfies some of your curiosity why he chose that strategy, because he could have just hung in that group, right? Let them do some work and then pound it. Well, Albertson was interviewed about a strategy, and I'll link to the article that I'm referring to, but Albertson said he banks on the downhills. He claims to be the world's fastest downhill runner. So he went out hard, and he slammed those downhills. He took every advantage, and he was saying that he's not very strong on the uphills, so he was worried that with the packs that he would just fade back and it would be putting him out of the race. Now, CJ held the all surface 50 kilometer world best in 242.30 on the track in 2020. It's since been broken, but that's a pretty cool accolade. And then on the women's side, we have Diana Kipyogi, who won the race. She's of Kenya in a time of 224.45, and this was her debut. She took charge at mile, um, charge 18 miles into the race, but was caught, and then she turned it around, and she seized control again back at mile 24. 
The first American woman to cross the line was Nell Rojas in 227.12 for sixth place. Now, our final piece of news in our world of running, so many exciting things we could share from the Boston and the Chicago Marathon, super inspiring stories uh, for many people, not just the top tier, but that's all we have for those events at this time. But our third piece of uh, news is kind of different. We're talking about high school Portage, Michigan, the Portage Cross Country Invitational. Dathan Ritzenhines High School Portage Invitational record fell to Riley uh, Howe, and he ran a blazing time of 1437.1. The reason why this is interesting is that Dathan Ritzenhines record has held for 20 years. And Dathan Ritzenhain is a multi-time uh, Olympian. He's the coach of the On Running Club. He's a big deal in distance running. And the only person to have come close to this record in 20 years was Grant Fisher. And he ran a time of 1442, just shy of Dathan Ritzenhain's 1441 record. So this is now we're going, that was micro to Michigan, but now let's zoom out to the USA. Riley now has the second fastest time by a high schooler in the event behind Dathan Ritzenhain. Back in 2000, Ritz posted a U.S. number one all-time 5K run of 1410.40. So here's to hoping for another Foot Locker champion from Michigan, from Riley Howe. Well, as always, if you like what you hear on the show, just remember that this is not the only avenue down which we drive content at A to Z Running. For the full experience, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, and as always, a home base is A to Z Running.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week.